From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. This week, the nation hit the so-called debt ceiling, a $34 trillion cap on U.S. debt after years of spending combined with tax cuts. Republicans in the House have vowed not to raise the borrowing limit again unless President Biden agrees to steep cuts in spending. But the president has balked, saying a debt limit increase would be for spending Congress has already authorized. Is the country heading for another shutdown amid a political standoff? Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Congressman Seth Mag. Magaziner. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Ted Nisi is on assignment this week, so I'm joined by my Target 12 colleague, Eli Sherman. And of course, our guest this week is Congressman Seth Magaziner up from Washington after a couple of tranquil weeks down there <laughs> to well, start. Thank you for having me. It's good to be back. Um, we're going to move from tranquil to rough waters. We started with the yeah. debt ceiling there. Um, as I said in the open, congressional Democrats want a clean bill, no strings attached. Republicans want conditions. Uh, to rein in government spending, uh, you know, and I have to tell you that that is something a lot of Americans uh, feel that many are uncomfortable with how much the country has spent, especially in recent years. Are you open to tying the debt ceiling to some spending yeah. cuts? Well, first of all, thank you again uh, for having me. It's uh, a true honor to represent our state in Washington and uh, really looking forward to getting up and running in the, the coming weeks and months. Um, to me, the voters were clear in Rhode Island and nationally in this most recent election and in 2020 that they're tired of chaos. They're tired of chaos in Washington. They want us in Congress to focus on the issues that matter, focus on lowering energy and drug prices, focus on protecting Social Security and Medicare and abortion rights. They want us to work together across party lines to get things done. What they don't want is chaos and gamesmanship like the Republican leadership is engaging in around this debt ceiling debate. So I want to make sure everybody at home understands what the consequences would be for working people in Rhode Island if the federal government were to stop paying its bills. First thing that would happen is that interest rates would spike. If investors, the financial markets feel that U.S. Treasury bonds are not going to be honored, that impacts interest rates across the board. Mortgage rates would spike even higher than they already are. If you're a small business with a line of credit that you need to help get you through the slow winter months, your costs on that line of credit are going to spike. The values of Rhode Islanders' retirement assets will plummet. And that's before you even talk about the impact of the federal government not making it's direct payments. So potentially stopping payments to Social Security beneficiaries, stopping payments on military this salaries. This is all very important, yeah. Congressman. So are you willing to have uh, to tie the debts, you know, the, raising the debt ceiling to any so spending cuts? We can have a legitimate debate about what level of spending the federal government should engage in. For the debt but ceiling? But it should not be tied to whether we should be paying our bills on costs that were already not? incurred. Because it is wrong to use financial calamity that would impact the lives of working people as leverage in a budget negotiation. Like, that is crazy and unfair to the working people of America who have been so much, have been through so much uh, between inflation and COVID and political turmoil to say, you know, for the Republicans in Congress to say, we are going to wreak even more financial havoc in ordinary people's lives unless you, President Biden, and the Democrats give us what we want, is hugely unfair and inappropriate. So what we should do is what we've always done as a country, pay the bills we've already incurred, and then have a debate around new spending when those appropriation bills come up later this year. So, so you're right that the yeah. debt ceiling is about debt already incurred, yeah. which is a topic I do think is, is often lost in this conversation. But an analogy here is if you're going to help out your teenager pay off a bill that they have incurred, you know mom and dad are going to want conditions on future spending. Why yeah. is that out of reason? Yeah, so the thing that would be irresponsible to do in that analogy is to not pay your credit card bill. Right, because if you don't pay your credit card bill, your credit rating drops, your cost of borrowing for future purchases goes up, and you're in a worse financial situation as a result. So if you think that your teenager is spending too much, sit down, have a conversation about what the future is going to look like, but don't say, we're just not going to pay the credit card bill. 
um, because there would be real financial consequences to that, just as there would be real financial consequences for the federal government not paying the bills that have already been incurred. And also, let's talk about those bills. The vast majority of them are payments to Americans, Social Security benefits, military pensions and salaries, and payments to vendors that are American companies that employ American workers. So the Republican position has been, we are going to do something that will really hurt working people in America unless you give us cuts that will also hurt working people in America. That is a totally unnecessary and outrageous position for them to be taking. What we should do, as we have done for the last 100 plus years, reauthorize uh, the raise in the debt ceiling, and then have a real debate around new appropriation bills in the coming year for what future spending should look like and what those priorities should be. All right, before we go to Eli, just one last question on this. In, in real brief, just from a practical sense, wh where do you think this is headed? I mean, yeah. do you think, bottom line, are, is this headed for a government shutdown? We've seen it before. Well, I hope not, because again, it would have real financial consequences for working people. And I think what the Republicans are underestimating, again, is that people are tired of chaos. They're tired of dysfunction. They rejected that in the last two elections. So as we get further down to the point where a shutdown is, is more imminent, I think the American people are going to reject this tactic by the Republicans, and the Republicans are going to pay a political price if they stick with it. We should raise the debt ceiling, as we've done repeatedly the last 100 years, then have a debate around what new appropriations should look like. The other thing I'd add just real quick, because I want to move is, on from this. Keep in mind, when President Trump and the Republicans were in power, they passed an enormous nearly $2 trillion tax cut that primarily benefited the most wealthy in our country, and now they're turning around and saying, well, we have too much debt and there's not enough money. Well, yeah, no kidding, because they passed an enormous tax cut that benefited primarily the wealthiest Americans. So that needs to be part of the conversation, too. If there's going to be a debate in Congress around what future spending should look like, that has to include a conversation around making sure that the people at the top finally pay their fair share. All right. Eli? Uh, Congressman, you spent the last year telling Rhode Islanders that you plan to go to Washington to get things done. Mm -hmm. I listened to your press conference on Thursday, and I was struck by um, how much you said how it might be challenging to get things done because of the GOP yeah. controlling the House. Is that the message now that Rhode Islanders should be expecting to hear from you over at least the next two yeah. years? So I came away from my first two weeks in Congress with two impressions about the Republican side of the aisle. The first is that there really are a lot of Republicans who are willing to work with Democrats and vice versa to get things done on key issues. And I do think that there are a lot of issues that are priorities of mine and priorities of Rhode Island where there could be real overlap between Republicans and Democrats. Career and technical education, uh, supporting uh, Ukraine and our NATO allies, supporting bringing more manufacturing jobs back to this country. I really do think there's a lot of fertile ground for bipartisan cooperation. The challenge, though, and the second thing that I saw in my first two weeks in Congress is the leadership on the Republican side is, at this point, totally in the pocket of the couple dozen most extreme members of their caucus. So the vast majority, I think, of people on both sides of the aisle are interested in working together, interested in getting things done. But the Republican leadership has signaled already that they're letting the most extreme elements in their party call the shots. I don't think that's tenable. I think that as we get further into the session, moderate Republicans or conservatives who just care about the country and care about getting things done are going to break ranks and look to work with Democrats to move an agenda forward. But the leadership on the Republican side is not making that easy. Can you name one or two Republicans that you've either met uh, over the last couple yeah. of weeks or that you've known from the past that you think that you could work on that some of these moderate Republicans who you see maybe could break ranks with the leadership? Yeah, absolutely. So there were some Republican members of Congress, are some Republican members of Congress who I knew previously, who I already have relationships with. There's a couple of former state treasurers who, being a former state treasurer I knew, uh, Ron Estes, Jake LaTurner, among others. Stephanie Bice from Oklahoma is somebody who I've known for a long time. Um, we went through sort of a leadership development program together. So. You know, I've had conversations with all of them already, and we're going to keep talking to see if we can find ways that we can work together. And there are others who have said very publicly in recent weeks that they're willing to cross party lines when it makes sense, in their view, to work with Democrats to get things done. Uh, people like Nancy Mace, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania. So I do think there are those Republicans who are open to having those collaborations with Democrats. Uh, but Kevin McCarthy and the leadership, at least so far, have been paying far more care and attention to the Matt Gateses and Lauren Boberts and Marjorie Taylor Greens, unfortunately, 
than the members of their Congress, I'm sorry, the members of their caucus who actually seem to want to work with Democrats to get things done. Yeah, I got to ask you about this, yeah. uh, Congressman, this whole classified documents uh, scandal that's going on. President Biden chided former President Trump in his handling of classified documents as, quote, irresponsible. On this issue, is President Biden a hypocrite? Well, I'm concerned any time a classified document is somewhere that it should not be. And uh, classified documents should not have been left in insecure settings by President Biden or by President Trump. There is a real difference here, though, in how each of those individuals have handled the situation. President Biden and his team, by all accounts, as soon as they realized that there were unsecured documents in the Penn Biden Center and at President Biden's home, immediately notified the appropriate authorities and have been cooperating. President Trump, in contrast, lied about the presence of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago, deflected, made excuses, still has not fully uh, given an explanation for why those documents were there, and obstructed investigators every step of the way to the point that a federal judge had to authorize the FBI to go in and get those documents back because Trump and his people would not provide them. So I'm concerned any time that you have classified documents someplace where they shouldn't be, it's not right that some of those documents uh, were in places they shouldn't have been uh, under President Biden, just as with President Trump. But the way that the two men have been handling this could not be more different. Yeah, and that is an important but distinction. The other, but the other thing the Biden administration did in, in this is they hid it from the public for over two months. Are yeah. you okay with that? No, no. And so we have to have a full count. Look, I think that the Attorney General did the right thing in um, appointing uh, a special, special prosecutor. prosecutor to investigate what happened. That is the appropriate thing to do. Um, but again, by all accounts, at this point, uh, the Biden administration is cooperating with investigators, whereas the Trump team are still uh, not willing to do so. It, regardless of the two situations, it's clearly taking a hit on uh, Biden's reputation. A, a new Reuters poll showed that mm. his approval rating is now down to close to its lowest level mm. uh, since he took office. Do you think that he should run in 2024? Yeah, listen, I think that President Biden has gotten a lot of really good things done that are helping working people in Rhode Island and across the country. Um, passing the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, passing the Bipartisan CHIPS Act to bring manufacturing jobs back to this country, uh, being tough with Vladimir Putin and uh, strengthening NATO. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, so he has delivered positive results for the American people, and if he decides that he wants to run again, he should. We have to go to a break in a little less than a minute here, so why don't we uh, end the first half on what what I think is kind of fun. I, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the last time I interviewed you was via Zoom. It was during the whole debacle yeah. with the, the speakership. We'll talk about that later, but uh, <laughs> the walls in your office were quite barren, <laughs> uh, yeah. I could see from the Zoom thing. And people at home don't understand, to get in office in Congress, for at least freshmen and not in leadership, there's a, a, a lottery system, right, yeah. to get your office. What was that like? Um, so the lottery was, uh, it was interesting. We, we, <laughs> we drew the fourth to last spot in the oh. lottery. So out of 441 delegates and representatives, we were, what, 437. Um, that being said, we have a great office. Um, there are no bad offices. We have a great office, uh, 1218 Longworth. We encourage any Rhode Islander who's visiting Washington, D.C., come in, say hello, and uh, we look forward to welcoming people there. So, I'm sorry, there are 435 members of Congress, right? Yeah. So what, tell me what the extra ones are, the extra so six. So delegates from the territories, Puerto Rico, oh, of course. Guam, okay. yeah, All et cetera. Right. All right, yeah. look, uh, we have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to uh, talk about Ukraine and the red line uh, that might have to be drawn there. Our guest is Congressman Seth Magaziner. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Eli Sherman is in for Ted Nisi, our guest this week, Congressman Seth Magaziner. Congressman, I, I want to move overseas here. The United States I guess, escalated its military assistance to Ukraine by sending over the highly advanced uh, Patriot missile system, or they're going to. The Biden administration has slowly come around on sending certain weapons that it didn't want to early on. It started, you know, with those shoulder-fired rockets and has gone to missiles that can strike Russian encampments within Ukraine. 
and now a system that can knock helicopters and jets out of the sky. So definitely the yeah. West is increasing their help. But I, I'm wondering what your red line in military aid is. Are there things the United States should not send that could provoke yeah. Vladimir Putin? So I think that, first of all, we have to continue to support Ukraine in their fight for freedom uh, against Russian aggression, Putin's aggression. Um, we all know that Vladimir Putin is unhinged. He uh, has an axe to grind with the U.S. and our NATO allies. And if he's allowed to successfully invade and conquer a peaceful democratic nation in Ukraine, he's not going to stop there. And other dictators around the world are watching too. So I think that generally the approach should be uh, we're not going to commit U.S. troops, but whatever the Ukrainians need in terms of material, intelligence, training, humanitarian aid, we and our allies should continue to provide. Uh, I think there should be understandings that the way that the Ukrainians use that material uh, should be sufficient for them to win the war, but not to widen the scope F of the fighter war beyond. Jets? Well, no, I mean, listen, I, I think that uh, uh, they should not use this material in a way that would lead to a wider war that involved uh, uh, fighting in other countries, right? The, uh, I think there's a concern that if this were to spill over into Poland or uh, NATO countries that, you know, then this could really snowball in a way that, that could be uh, very destabilizing globally. But no, in terms of giving Ukraine the material that they need to, uh, to win this phase of the war, to take back occupied areas like Crimea, uh, I think we should support. There was some reporting this week uh, that Germany set conditions for exports on German-made tanks, mm -hmm. uh, saying that they would only send them to Kyiv if the U.S. also sent its tanks. I'm wondering um, if you think or have any concerns as to whether or not the West is, um, you know, on the same page in its support of Ukraine. Yeah. I mean, I think it's natural that, you know, when you have sort of a multilateral alliance like NATO where everyone's expected to chip in, you know, for a shared goal, there's going to be some posturing in which countries are going to chip in how much and, and so forth. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that we should uh, take a serious look in the U.S. at providing uh, the types of tanks that the Ukrainians have asked for. Um, I know that Senator Reid feels similarly, among others. Um, we need to give them the support that they need to win. Uh, Putin cannot be allowed to succeed. And, um, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we don't deplete our resources to the point that we're not able to defend our interests more broadly, but to the extent that we're able to provide material to help the Ukrainians without creating vulnerabilities for ourselves elsewhere in the world, I believe we should do so. What's going to be your first piece of legislation? Yeah, so um, because we had sort of an unusual start to the session with <laughs> the vote for speaker uh, everything's been bumped back a little bit, um, so I won't be able to start introducing bills probably until you know, the end of next week at the earliest. Um, but I've begun co-sponsoring um, legislation that's already been introduced by others, so um, by returning members. So the first bill that I co-sponsored uh, a couple days ago was a bill to ban members of Congress from trading stocks. Uh, remember, this is something that I talked about often during the campaign. I think well, that it's an of, issue that hits home. Absolutely, and I think that members of Congress have access to just too much inside information and uh, should not be in a position where they could be tempted to use that information to benefit themselves financially. So Representative Spanberger from Virginia, Chip Roy from Texas, a re Democrat and Republican, have put in that bill for the second time, the second session. Uh, I'm an original co-sponsor this year. Um, as far as which legislation we will be the Primary, primary sponsor of yeah. first. We're still having those conversations internally, but I'll tell you one issue that I'm focusing in on that I'm concerned about is that we still have ongoing shortages in uh, the workforce and healthcare settings in Rhode Island and across the country uh, that are really dangerous and are impacting uh, health and safety for patients. And so uh, it's possible that it'll be something uh, to do with helping to address staffing needs at hospitals and other healthcare settings. Um, I don't know if that'll be the first one we put in, but it's one of the ones that will likely be one of the first what does uh, that issues look that we like? try more, to tackle. More money for nurses or? Yeah, nurses, techs, um, I mean, even uh, custodial staff. I mean, the, thing, the people who keep hospital systems and other healthcare settings running. Um, and, and listen, I know that there 
our workforce shortages in industries all across the economy, but I think in healthcare settings, the consequences are particularly severe, and you know people are in some cases dying because uh, hospitals and other healthcare uh, 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 facilities are so understaffed, and uh, that's an issue that I want to dig deeper into, and I think we'll probably introduce something in the coming weeks. I'm just curious on the legislation on st stock trading. I know it's early to tell, but do you think there would be enough bipartisan support to pass that? I hope so. I mean, there, there certainly will be broad bipartisan support. So. Um, we're already, I think this bill was just introduced a few days ago, we're already up to more than 40 co-sponsors, Democrats and Republicans, uh, progressives, conservatives, um, and it's something that the American people clearly want. Uh, so my hope is that this bill will be given an up or down vote and that it'll pass, uh, but that's obviously up to the, uh, the Republican leadership under Kevin McCarthy who controls which bills make it to the floor. Uh, another um, thing that got delayed because of the the uh, delayed vote for the speaker or the long vote that it took to choose mm -hmm. him was uh, committee assignments. And yeah. so you haven't actually been assigned to any committees. Um, as a freshman lawmaker, you probably don't have a lot of sway over which ones you'll land on, but if you you know could wave a magic wand, uh, where would you like to serve? Yeah, um, you're right. Uh, well, we're still waiting to find out our committee assignments. We think it'll be a couple more weeks before we get them. And it's all because the protracted race for speaker just delayed the process on a lot of this stuff. Mm. Um, ultimately, I'd like to try to get to the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, this is one that freshmen don't typically get on, so it might be a few years before we get there, assuming the voters uh, send us back for another term. But um, that's a committee that I think has a lot of areas of jurisdiction that matter to Rhode Islanders, manufacturing jobs, uh, energy policy, including clean energy and the jobs associated with that. Uh, it actually re it has a hand in regulating drug prices, which is something that's very important to Rhode Islanders. Uh, so you know, I put in a marker already that that's a committee I'd like to get to. Um, it may take a couple years for us to get there. Um, but I'll happily serve and roll up my sleeves wherever they put me. Um, I'm interested in education and labor issues. I'm interested in homeland security. Um, but wherever they put me, uh, I will uh, look forward to serving and uh, trying to deliver results for the people of Rhode Island. President Biden made his first trip to the border since taking office. Um, when you look at a 12-month ending in October, the New York Times reports that the U.S. Border Patrol has encountered more migrants trying to enter the country illegally since 1960. El Paso, which is where the president visited, just has been absolutely overwhelmed. The system itself is overwhelmed. Should he have gone down sooner? Yeah. So there is a real crisis at the border. And there are, I think, tangible things that Congress can do to help fix it. Um, but before I get to that, let me just remind everybody watching at home, and I'm going to remind people a lot about this over the next couple of years as this topic is debated in Congress. These are human beings we're talking about. These are people who are running away from something. They are running away from gang violence. They're running away from persecution. And risking their lives to make a journey that they know they may not survive because they are desperate. And so I put that out there because I am concerned that on the Republican side uh, in Congress, uh, there are going to be those members of Congress who are looking to grandstand, looking to vilify uh, these asylum seekers. And we have to center this conversation on these are individuals who are running scared from so something. So you know people are going to hear you, they're going to hear that and they're going to go, oh, Seth Magaziner is an open border guy. No. So here's what we do. We have to, number one, have secure borders. So I do support making sure. What does that, that mean? We, well, I think it means giving Border Patrol, giving um, uh, ICE the resources that they need to do their jobs. It also, though, means making sure that we put the resources in place to speed up the process of vetting asylum applications. The reason that you have these migrant camps, the reason that you have cities like El Paso dealing with these humanitarian crises of, of thousands and, and thousands of people uh, showing up is because the wait to have an asylum application processed and either approved or denied under law can take years. Mm -hmm. And so resources to speed up that process so that those who are entitled to asylum legally are able to get it and are able to settle. So we have and one those minute left. So, can be set back. Well, on, so on, while they wait, on what side of the border should they wait? Well, I think that's where we have to work with Mexico and with other countries in the region to make sure that we have a comprehensive plan where everybody's doing their part to make sure that people wait in 
humane conditions. And so the third thing I was going to say, and, and I know we're limited on time, yeah. is we have to do a better job engaging with our allies in the region to crack down on violence from the cartels that are driving a lot of the people to this country and to make sure that we have uh, facilities uh, on both sides of the border uh, where people can be processed in a humane fashion. All right. Uh, real quick, uh, 15 seconds, you've been flying a lot. Are you running into any of the mayhem and the delayed flights or anything like that? Thankfully not yet, but it is, it is a real issue and one that I'm keeping an eye on. And Congress might take yeah. it up in the next semester. All right, uh, Congressman Seth Magaziner, right. thanks for joining us on the program. Don't forget, you can catch Newsmakers as a podcast. There's the QR code on the lower left-hand side of your screen, so run up to the TV, I guess, with your phone and scan that, and then I'll take you right to the podcast, and you can subscribe to it. I want to thank you for watching, and uh, Ted Nisi will be back next week. If you missed any of it, it's also on WPRI.com. For Eli Sherman, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.